The real boy behind the Green Mile is not John Coffey, but George Steiny Jr. George was born October 21, 1929 in South Carolina. He was 5'1 and weighed about 95 pounds. Unfortunately, poor George was wrongfully convicted of murder in the middle of the Jim Crow era. Before I get into the case of George Steiny, I will briefly go over his background and his family's background. He was raised in the segregated mill town of Alkaloo in South Carolina. George and his family lived near the railroad tracks in a three-room company house reserved for black families. He attended Alkaloo School for Black Children, where he was a seventh grader. His father, George Steiny Sr., was a former sharecropper and employed at the town sawmill. His mother's name was Amy, who cooked at the Alkaloo School. George Steiny Jr. had two brothers. John and Charles, John being his half-brother, and two sisters, Catherine and Amy. And yes, the mom is also Amy and the child is also Amy, so there's just two Amys. Um, so I get it. There's just a lot of names thrown at you, but the ones mainly mentioned is pretty much George Steiny and his sister Amy. March 24th, 1944. George and his sister were outside playing in the yard, as children do. Two young white girls, Mary Emma Thames and Betty June Binnaker, briefly approached them to ask where they could find wildflowers. A very innocent encounter. A child. These are children, you know? Of course it's innocent. But, however, hours later, um, the girls failed to come home in which a search party was organized to find them. George even joined the search party because he just saw them and he wants to help them out because, I mean, it was not like they were rude. They were looking for wildflowers. They were children. Unfortunately, as a child, he is young and naive, so he casually mentioned to a bystander of the search party that he had just seen the girls earlier. The following morning, their dead bodies were found in a shallow, damp ditch. <sighs> Guess what happened? I'm sure all of us could see it coming. Um, Clarendon County law enforcement officers learned from a witness that the girls were seen talking to Steiny. The police knocked on George's door and immediately was arrested for Mary's and Betty's murder. He was subjected to hours and hours of interrogation without his parents, an attorney, or any witnesses to help him out, pretty much. The sheriff later claimed that Steiny confessed to murders with no written or signed statement to support that claim. The sheriff either flat out lied or coerced the young boy to confess to a crime he did not commit. I can't imagine being in a small interrogation room for hours while grown men are yelling at me that I committed a murder and calling me a liar if I denied it. I can't imagine being utterly alone with no family or counsel to guide me in that interrogation room. And I cannot imagine being a black boy in a white dominated society who is seen as a threat by the color of my skin. And at the end of the day, two white girls were seen with a black boy and that's all it took for him to be a scapegoat. An officer named H.S. Newman wrote in a handwritten statement, quote, I arrested a boy by the name of George Stidey. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches long. He said he put it in a ditch about six feet from the bicycle, end quote. Newman refused to reveal where Stidey was detained as rumors of lynching spread throughout the town. March 26 is when a mob attempted to lynch George, but he had already been moved to an out-of-town jail, um, what is even more sad is that George's father was fired from his job and his family was forced to flee due to the threats that they were getting from their community. So not only is this poor boy being detained for, you know, murder that he did not commit, but his family has to pay the price for it. And for what? April 24th, 1944. George Steiny faced a trial that was systematically against him alone. Black people were not allowed inside the courthouse, and his sorry excuse of an attorney, one with political aspirations, failed to call a single witness. The attorney, Charles Plowden, did not challenge the three officers who testified that George confessed to the murders. It, it's just so frustrating that all the odds were stocked against George. A defense counsel is supposed to defend their client, no matter who that client is, not sit back and relax, but I digress. Plowden also did not challenge the prosecution's presentation of two differing versions of George's verbal confession. So they can't even keep their story straight with the, the verbal confession. So the first confession was that George was attacked by the girls after trying to help one of the girls who had fallen in the ditch and then killed them in self-defense. The second version was that he followed the girls and then killed them. 
There is no written record of George's confession, not surprisingly, apart from Deputy Newman's statement, and also not surprisingly. It's just, they just wanted to pin someone down, and they they were most definitely not looking for a white killer. They just, yeah, that's all I gotta say for that. Prosecution called three witnesses, one being Reverend Francis Batson, who discovered the bodies of the two girls, and the two doctors who performed the post-mortem examination. Batson's account blew gaping holes in the prosecution's case. The girls were badly beaten with fatal blows to the skull. Head wounds tend to bleed profusely, okay? So keep that in mind. Yet Batson recalled that he saw very little blood around the girls' bodies, suggesting that they had been murdered elsewhere. He did not see any drag marks or footprints leading to the ditch. And hold on, just let me ask a question here. How could a small boy be able to beat two girls to death with the amount of strength that was, you know, used to bash a girl's heads in? I mean, this is what Charles Platten should be asking to these witnesses, um, to Batson and, you know, telling the jury, like, this small boy, this would be impossible. But no, he's just useless. And, ugh. Anyway. Since doctors were used as witnesses, the court allowed discussion of the possibility of rape due to bruising on one of the girl's genitalia. Um, I think it was uh, Binnaker. Uh, just to add a cherry on the top, the defense counsel, or George's counsel, if you could even call him that, did not call any witnesses, did not cross-examinate witnesses, and offered little to no defense. The trial lasted two and a half hours, and this is a murder trial. Like, a murder trial lasted for two and a half hours. That's unheard of. And as was typical at the time, George was tried before an all-white jury, not surprisingly, because black people in the South were prohibited from voting and thus ineligible to serve on juries. It took 10 minutes of deliberation to convict 14-year-old George Steiny of rape and murder. Judge Philip H. Stoll sentenced George to death by electrocution. Of course, there is no transcript of the trial and no appeal was filed by George's counsel. Despite appeals from the black advocacy groups, Governor Allen Johnson refused to intervene. George remains the youngest person executed in the U.S. in the 20th century. He was executed on June 16, 1944 at 7.30 p.m. George was charged, tried, convicted, and executed in just 83 days. Now, we all know, if this was a white boy, it would have taken a lot more than 83 days to do, you know, all of the previously mentioned processes. There, there's also a movie called um, 83 Days to give like a visual presentation of the George Steiny case if you're interested. Um, it, it, that movie was just so sad. So just like make sure you're ready for it because it even makes grown men cry. You know what I mean? Um, and I, now I'm just going to describe the heart-wrenching execution that George faced. George was prepared for execution by electric chair using a Bible as a booster seat because he was too small for the chair. The chair was not built to be used on children. It was built for grown men. His arms, legs, and body was, was restrained by the chair. His father was only allowed to approach the chair to say his final words to his son, and an officer asked if George, you know, if he had any last words to say before the execution takes place. But he only replied with, quote, no, sir, end quote. The electrocutioner pulled a strap from the chair and placed it over George's mouth, causing him to break into tears. And he then placed a face mask over George's face, which did not fit him. It was just too big on him. And while this was happening, he was still like crying and sobbing. I mean, which is understandable. He's a child and he is witnessing his, you know, he's preparing for his own death. That's something that no child should go through. When the electricity turned on, the mask slipped off, revealing his tears streaming down George's face. It also took two more jolts of electricity before he died because the officers were unable to secure the electrodes properly. Not only was George wrongfully accused and convicted of murder, but his life could not go out painless. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Crowley. George Steiny's murder conviction was thrown out in 2014. His siblings claimed that his confession was coerced and that he had an alibi. At the time of the murders, he was with his sister, Amy, watching the family cow. 
They also noted that a man named Wilford Johnny Hunter, who claimed to be George's cellmate, said that he denied the murders. Quote, he said, Johnny, I, I didn't, didn't do it. He said, why would they kill me for something I didn't do? End quote. It took a jury of white men 10 minutes to find George guilty, and it would take 70 years before George was exonerated. George Frierson, a local historian who helped open the case, stated in interviews that, quote, there has been a person that has been named as being the culprit who is now deceased, and it was said by the family that there was a deathbed confession, end quote. Frierson said that the rumored culprit came from a well-known, prominent white family, but it was not confirmed. I mean, is this surprising to you? Because it's not to me. Of course it was done by a white person, and of course a, a black boy was, you know, pinpointed as the target because, you know, police certainly did not seem to be looking for a white killer. And it just so happened that George Diney, he, he, he was there at the wrong time, wrong place, however that saying goes, my mind is kind of mush right now because of this story but um a member of this prominent family had served in the initial coroner's inquest jury which had recommended that george be prosecuted do, do you hear that because i hear a cover-up farson said that he will not name the person due to the fear of defamation but he said that the guy was a truck driver and everyone in the community knew him however the community never talked about this person um, it's probably because South Carolina is governed by old families with old money who are a tight-knit bunch. The system allowed a murderer to get away with murder by using an innocent black boy as a scapegoat, and I'm pretty sure everyone, even the police, knew it was probably not him. And that, my friends, is the horrible story of George Steiny. Quick note. Um, Green Mile was inspired by the George Steiny case, but I noticed like a metaphor, or maybe I'm like looking too deep into it, but you know how John Coffey is like tall, big, strong, very intimidating looking, but like once you get to know him, he's like a little teddy bear, but you know, when you l look at him from a glance, you're just like, oh, I want to stay away from that dude, but you know, this could mean that this is how white people perceive all black people, just violent and scary. So ousting them from society is trying, you know, to quote unquote, protect their community. And also, what's your view on the death penalty? I am personally against it, um, even though some people probably do need to be wiped off the face of the planet. Uh, but the existence of the death penalty is just more harmful than good, in my opinion. Like, not only do some innocent people will be sentenced to death, like George, but it's awfully expensive to keep it up. America loves, loves, loves paying people in prison rather than, you know, rehab. And some of these states, like Alabama, loves to keep up the death penalty, even though it takes death row inmates decades before execution. Uh, and I think I was, like, reading something, and uh, I think the statistic was, like, for every eight people executed in the U.S. since, like, the 1970s, uh, one person has been wrongfully convicted and later exonerated. So these are like confirmed, not, and that doesn't even take into account like for all the cases that were not confirmed, you know? So it's like a one in eighth chance. I mean, if you think about it, that's, that's a lot. I, I don't know, but I hate the death penalty. Um, I, I really do. I hate the death penalty. Like, Ugh, I, it just should not exist. But tell me what you think. I am very open-minded. I will not judge. Maybe a little... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but before I end this video, I want to just say that a man recently was wrongfully convicted of murder and needs signatures on a petition. His name is Rocky Myers. Bailey Saren made a great video about, uh, about it called... Um, an innocent man on death row or something like that and i will leave a link to the petition in bailey's video um in the description below thank you for watching make good choices and stay safe ciao